So there's this question that I get pretty often. It goes something like this. Hey, I'm trying to figure out my practice routine. So I was thinking I would spend 20 minutes a day learning scales and then 15 minutes working on sight reading and then 30 minutes on a repertoire piece and then work on this exercise book that I have and so on and so forth. Do you think that's a good practice routine? Now, this is a great question to be asking because you're at least thinking, how do I spend my time? But it's still a little bit backwards. And you can kind of think of it like this. Imagine someone saying, hey, I'd like to build something. So I bought some boards and I'm gonna cut them up and then nail them together and paint them. Do you think that's going to work? I don't know, what are you trying to build? Are you trying to build a birdhouse or are you trying to build a website? It's a little backwards to think, you know, is this random stuff that I'm doing going to turn into something that I want that I haven't really defined yet? And music is kind of like that. You can imagine that you're trying to build a skill. You're trying to become good at playing an instrument. So you're not just gonna do a bunch of stuff and hope that one day it turns into you being good at your instrument. You want to figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish and then what particular path you would like to take to get there, and there are many different choices, and then figure out you know, what are the things that I need to work on along this path that will help me become good at this thing. All right, so in this particular lesson, I just wanna show you what the options are. What are the different paths you can take to eventually become good at playing an instrument. Next lesson, we'll look at the pros and cons and the details on why you might wanna choose one over the other and how that might change based on your instrument or the style you wanna learn. And then the last lesson, we'll look at the more practical side of how do you translate that into an actual practice routine? How do you figure out how exactly to spend your time? The first thing to understand is that there are basically four stages to playing an instrument. And we'll start with the last one because I think that's the simplest one. I just call this performance. Basically, no matter what route you take, you are eventually going to be putting your fingers on your instrument or your mouth, depending on what you play, and you're going to make music come out of it. So you will eventually just play music. Now that seems like kind of a stupid and obvious thing to bring up, but it's actually really important. Remember, that's your goal, is to play music. Your goal is not to be really good at playing scales or to know lots of chords or to be able to play you know, with perfect time to a metronome at 140 beats per minute. That stuff only matters if it's helping you achieve this goal of playing music. So let's back up to the beginning. The first stage or the first thing you need is you need a source of music. So really broadly, you can play music that other people have written, say other people, and that could be, you know, you want to learn the Moonlight Sonata or you want to learn the violin part for you know, the piece that your orchestra director gave you or you're going to learn the solo to Ride the Lightning somebody else's music, you're gonna learn it. Your other option for a source of music is yourself. So you could write music and then play it. Now that could be like you've sat down and composed a piece and you're gonna learn it and rehearse it and then play it later. Or you can just make stuff up off the top of your head, which we call improv. So you can sit there and just invent things and play it. You could also do a bit of a mix. And this is basically what jazz is. So with jazz, you take someone else's music, usually a, a simple set of chords and a basic melody, and you add to it. You sort of take that as a starting point and put in your own stuff and, and mix it all together. So that kind of falls in between. So there's a bit of a spectrum here. And we'll say improv can be a mix of the two. It also could just be purely your own stuff that you've made up. So very, very broadly, those are your options for where you get your music from. The next stage or part of the process, and I don't really know what to call this. I'm just going to say learning method. But basically, 
you have to have a way of getting this music into your head. So you have quite a few options here. You can use written methods or written music. And this uh, is what people usually think of when you think of music or sheet music. So there's an example. This is just a guitar piece, sheet music. But this is a... Some people actually kind of mix this up. This is not music, even though it's what you think of when you visualize it. Music is sound. It's just a bunch of pitches and, and rhythms and that stuff. This is just a visual or written representation of it. So sheet music. You can use that as a way of getting the music into your head. There are other kinds of written music though. So for guitar, there's, this is that Metallica solo. Tablature, which is a very, very different way of writing down music, and we'll get more into that next week, but that's another option for written music. Uh, there are there are some other things you could, you know, have written out chords. So you could have a, you know, the C symbol and then an E flat, and you could use that as a way of learning music. Um, there's some other kind of obscure methods. So like for piano, there's something called a piano roll. And this isn't exactly written because it, it has to be animated. So you could say it's, it's a, you'd have to see it as a video or something or have some kind of software that animates this for you. But you basically get these little bars and they, they sort of move across and collide into this image of a piano and it shows you, you know, which notes you have to play. Um, that's not usually something you use, but that's available. So you have something like that. And there's probably some other kind of obscure methods for other instruments that I'm not thinking about, fingering charts and that sort of thing. Um, another method you have is, I don't really know what to call this either, we'll say like a, a visual representation of where your fingers go or how to, how to play your instrument. And I know that written music is also visual, so this isn't a great naming system, but Essentially, you could have somebody show you how to play a song. So they could say, hey, your, your fingers go here and there and there on a piano. Or like if you walk into your first guitar lesson ever, this is usually what happens. The teacher will say, okay, put your finger here and put your finger here and do this with your right hand. And that's how you play smoke on the water. And you can learn that way. You could also learn by watching a video of somebody doing it or, or whatever, but you can use the visual information to learn how to play something. Kind of doesn't work for everything. Like if you're a singer, you can't really like stare at somebody's throat and mouth and figure out what's going on. Or even like a trumpet or a flute, like you can get the fingering, but not the mouth stuff. So there's limits and it depends on your instrument. But that is a viable option if you're trying to, you know, get music into your head. The other option is auditory learning. So this is, what people mean, I really hope I spelled that right. This is what people mean when they say learning by ear. Basically you take the sound, the actual music, and you figure out how to replicate those sounds on your instrument. So you're matching it up by listening to it and listening to your instrument and figuring out how to play it that way. Now, like I said, I'm gonna save the, the really nitty gritty details for next week because I don't want to get too far into the weeds before we've laid out the big picture here. But just realize that there are some huge choices you can already make here. I mean, I, I back when I used to teach private lessons, I've had people come in and say, hey, I've been playing music for 20 years and I am not the kind of musician that I thought I would be and I'm, I'm not very happy. They'll say, you know, I, I usually just sit in my room and like I have music and I, and I learn to play it that way. But I joined the church group and they just gave me a bunch of links to songs on YouTube. And they said, go learn it. And I am totally lost. I have no clue what to even do. And it's, well, that person has chosen a, a different path or a different way through this. And that has really shaped the type of musician they've become. So to try to completely switch to something else it feels like starting from zero, at least for a while. So just realize that there are very big choices here and this is the kind of stuff that you, you wanna pay attention to and, and make sure that the way you choose to learn is gonna lead you to the thing that you'd like to eventually get to. 
Anyway, like I said, more on that next time. The third stage, the kind of the missing piece. Um, if you're going to be playing music on your instrument, that information has to be ready to go. Like you, if your fingers are sitting there about to do stuff, you have to have some way of getting that music out of you or into your instrument. So we'll call this storage. And I don't mean, I don't mean like storing PDFs of sheet music on your hard drive. I mean like this has to be right there, ready to go. Now, often enough, this means you store things in your memory. And you might think, yeah, okay, I'll memorize stuff. But there's actually many different ways of memorizing things. So what people usually do, and this is, in my opinion, one of the most neglected, misunderstood aspects of playing an instrument, is how do you keep stuff in your head? So most people will just do muscle memory. And you know they'll play a piece over and over, and eventually it just becomes familiar, and they can just do it, sit down and play that piece. Now, of course, your muscles don't actually have memory. What you're really doing is you're memorizing and becoming familiar with what it feels like to play a certain piece of music, like those movements in your fingers and arms and everything. That is just something you remember how to do. Muscle memory is necessary and incredibly powerful if you're going to play things that are difficult, but it can betray you. And I've had this happen and I've seen it happen where somebody is playing a concert or in front of people and suddenly it just disappears and they're blank and they have nothing. And it's like the most terrifying thing as a musician. So muscle memory is a part of the puzzle, but it's, it's a tricky one. There are other ways to remember things though. And this is where it gets a little bit weird. These three different methods, written music, visual music, auditory music, those are also ways that you can use to store stuff in your memory. So, you know, written music like, like this, I can learn music by looking at this page and understanding it and playing it, but I can also store it in this format. I can, in my head, remember what these notes look like on this page, and I can use that, you know, in order to play it back. So that is one way of storing things in my head. Another way, is the visual how your fingers look type of information. So if I'm you know sitting here and learning something on a piano, I can remember what it looks like to put a finger here and there and, and whatever, and I can build up a piece of music that way. The other option is to remember what something sounds like. Now, if you're a singer, this is very often what you use. It's, you can't really remember visually what your mouth and throat look like. You could remember the sheet music, but usually you just remember what something sounds like. And then when it comes time to sing it, you're just translating those sounds into, you know, what comes out of your mouth. So you can use these three different methods of storing things in your memory. And same thing over here, it can make, it can have a huge effect on your musical experience and how you choose to remember stuff. And most people don't even think about this. They just kind of do stuff and hope that it works right and they remember things. So those are your options for memory. Now you don't actually have to store things in your memory. You can store stuff externally, like on paper. So an extreme example of this would be sight reading. So when you're sight reading a piece of music, you, you know, this would be insanely difficult to sight read. So this wouldn't really work, but imagine something simpler. If I had a relatively simple piece of music that I've never seen before, and I'm good enough at this process, I could look at it and just play it all in real time and translate those notes directly into what comes out of my instrument. So that's the, the far opposite side of this, is that I don't remember this stuff at all, it's just on paper, and I am good enough at this process to just do all that in real time. Usually though, you never go to a concert and watch somebody sight read music. What often happens is a bit of a mix between these two. So let's say I'm gonna learn that Moonlight Sonata. I could just memorize the whole thing where I can sit down with nothing in front of me and just play it all back. 
but I could also use a bit of a mix, so I'm not gonna sight read that. Way, way too difficult, but I could have most of it memorized. All the hard parts, I can sit there and play and I'm not really having to read every note, but I can use the music to help me know like when the sections change and you know what's coming next without having to have it all strictly memorized. And even some of the easier parts, I don't necessarily remember them. I can kind of read them off the page and they're simple enough to where I can do that. And if you're like playing in an orchestra or something where a lot of the music, like some parts might be very difficult and you have them memorized, but other parts are very slow or you don't have any notes for 20 measures or something. Often enough, you'll use the music to, to help you through those parts where you're not really memorizing it. But for the difficult stuff, you can't really read that in real time. So you, you know, are using your real memory. Anyway, those are some different options there. We will spend quite a few lessons on memory because it is so important and something that just doesn't get talked about very often. Now, if you look at this whole thing, there are some very, you can kind of draw this line down the middle. And there are some very important differences between things that happen in this half and things that happen in this half. So this stuff, as far as finding music to play and you know, learning it off of, you know, a written piece of paper or, you know, learning it visually or auditory, like you can spend as much time as you want doing these things. Now, if it takes you five years to get a piece, you know, into your head, that's not great. You're not going to make much progress, but theoretically you can spend as much time as you want over here. When you're in this half of things, when it comes to having things in your memory and getting that into playing an instrument, this stuff kind of has to happen in real time. Now, you might think, well, memory, I can spend as much time as I want, you know, getting something into my memory, but the recall part, reading that into playing an instrument has to happen in real time. And the way you store something in your head can make the difference between being able to do that and not. I have seen plenty of people play a piece of music over and over for sometimes years and never actually get it memorized correctly where they can pull it out and perform it. You know, there's always the same mistakes in the same places. They always mess something up. And more often than not, that is your memory having an issue. So you have to do these things in real time. These don't necessarily have to be. And that just means that you, you want to be very careful and conscious about what path you choose and how you set yourself up for eventually having very good memory of, of a piece of music and being able to play that back fluidly and correctly and, and all that sort of thing. And if you have a problem, you want to be able to recognize where that problem is and how you address it, whether that's changing your practice routine or, or just knowing how to address the, the weak part of this, this chain. And most most people have a tendency to fixate on this last part, the, the actual playing performance part of making your fingers move and, and getting sounds to come out of your instrument. And that's why many people just think, well, I, I gotta play lots of scales or I gotta work on these exercises or I gotta play this piece faster and faster so that I get really good at it. And they kind of imagine that they're becoming this ninja and their fingers are getting, you know, this dexterity and they're, they're learning to play. But and that's important. I'm not saying it isn't like you are going to have to develop the ability to do these things physically, but that's like 20% of the process you're going to spend or should spend much more time setting yourself up for that. And, and, you know, getting things into your memory and the process of reading them or figuring it out. But this is kind of the glamorous part. It's not necessarily the most important part. And usually when you see mistakes, it often comes from some other piece of this process. Anyway, reflect on that a bit. Start thinking about how you'd like to approach this problem of learning to play your instrument. Next week, I'll touch, talk much more in detail about why you would want to choose one thing over the other and how that's going to change the way or change the type of musician you wind up being or just changing your experience of learning music. You know, learning 
to be good at improvising and, and creating your own stuff out of your own head is vastly different than learning to play somebody else's music or even vastly different than composing your own piece. Um, and then learning by ear versus learning by you know visual information or by written information, also vastly different and will turn you into a different type of musician. So begin thinking about that next week. We'll get into the details and then the week after talk much more about how to build your routine and actually start becoming good at one or potentially more of the different paths you have through here. Thanks for hanging in. Um, leave any questions you like. I will see you next week.